Good afternoon, and I'm very pleased to be here at the Jamie Research Institute to uh, talk about this book. And <clears throat> the first point I want to make is really to encourage you to read the book, read what you can about it. I think this is a book that uh, matters a lot, and um, I'd like just to go quickly through the main reasons why I think you should take it seriously. The first is it's pretty unusual to find a reflection which looks back over such a long period. A period of 60 years of Japanese cooperation and looks at it from its earliest days. I recognize Yoshiaki Abe in the, in the room who's worked hard on that part of the story right up to the present day. It involved a wide range of experts, both uh, Japanese and from overseas. And here on the Japanese side, people going right back to the early days of Japan's engagement with the World Bank and so on. I'd like to congratulate uh, JICA Research Institute under your leadership, uh, Hiroshi, for the way in which the whole thing was managed. I thought that we had extremely good interaction among the authors of the various chapters. I remember very uh, positively the experience we had together in Sapporo when we uh, discussed that, and I think it was a very good way of doing it. And I'd like to under underline the point you made about the value of looking at Japan's cooperation in the round, not just the bilateral cooperation, but the multilateral cooperation, and trying to make sense of the whole contribution that Japan has made. The issues discussed in the book are intrinsically important in their own right. And I think they underline the need for a clearer understanding in Japan itself of how its policies on ODA and its instruments fit into Japan's approach to its place in the world more broadly and its involvement in key issues around sustainable development, which uh, are very much issues of today and I'm sure will be discussed uh, intensively at the summit here in Japan later this week. So with that, let me turn to the, um, the chapter in which I was responsible, which is the relations between Japan and the OECD Development Assistance Committee, or DAC. And just to give you the main headline from that chapter, first of all, uh, I said that Japan has been integrated into well, what Japan itself at one point called the Western Donor System since joining the DAC's predecessor, the Development Assistance Group for its very first meeting in March 1960. But it's done that while maintaining a set of distinctly Asian and Japanese approaches. And these include a strong focus on self-help, which uh, Kato-san has already referred to, a preference for loans over grants, for projects over programs, and economic infrastructure over social services, low levels of conditionality, a close relationship with Japan's private sector and a strong geographical focus on Asia. Other issues have at times clouded its relationship with the DAC, and I'll mention one or two of those going through this. But both sides have learned lessons from each other and very significant adjustments to Japanese aid practices. And the same is true of many other members of the DAC, not just about Japan, have taken place over time. At times, Japan has taken a leading role in policy discussions of some areas, such as untying in the 1970s, the development of the International Development Goals in the 1990s, when Japan essentially proposed the idea that eventually came into being as the Millennium Development Goals a few years later, and <clears throat> triangular cooperation in the past um, couple of decades where Japan has been a standout leader among the uh, members of the OECD. However, I would say that Japan has too often found itself in a defensive posture when both sides might have been more creative. In my chapter, <clears throat> I devoted a good deal of space to successive aid reviews of Japan, taking more or less one in each decade from the very first in 1962. And I should explain that right from the start of the OECD Development Assistance Committee, the idea was that every member would be reviewed to see if its practices were meeting up to good practice as the DAC began to define it. And it was done in a very OECD way, going back, I think, to Marshall Plan days, where two countries were nominated for the examiners, 
and they were examined whichever country it was. So Japan has played a big role over the years, both as examining, examining other countries and also being examined itself. Um, so I went back into the OECD archives, which are in a good state, if you don't mind going through some slow processes. And uh, I found it fascinating to read the, um, the story in this way because it shows how much change and how quickly in the world. Uh, so from one point of view, I found it a very interesting exercise. From another point of view, I found it rather an unsatisfactory one. I'll explain both those points if I may. I found it particularly interesting, notably the, the earlier reviews, which shows what a different world was then the context within which decisions about aid were taken, taken and how things have changed. Here are a few quick examples from the earlier years. In 1962, the Japanese memorandum points out in stark terms the macro situation as then seen by the government of Japan. I quote, for the continued expansion and the improvement in the effectiveness of aid to developing countries which Japan is desirous to maintain, it is essential for Japanese, Japan's economy to continue its balanced growth. As Japan's per capita income is still at a comparatively lower level than those of European and North American countries, the government of Japan is taking various measures to raise the nation's income level while achieving a balanced growth. The trend of Japan's international balance of payments has a direct bearing on Japan's capacity to develop new systems. The most fundamental problem is the tendency in Japan's trade structure which shows an adverse trade balance vis-a-vis -vis the industrialized countries as a whole, and a favorable balance towards the underdeveloped countries. The close link between Japan's capacity for external assistance and her balance of payments position must be stressed. And the Secretariat, in commenting on this report, point out that Japan at the time was the poorest member of the development assistance group, uh, apart from Portugal. So you see a country which is really struggling was positioning itself in the post-war world, extremely short of foreign exchange, and wondering how it can afford to provide assistance to its neighbors in Southeast Asia when it has a, a deficit trade balance with the uh, America and Europe. 10 years later, a completely different picture. 1972, the dollar's been floated, Japan is growing rapidly, the tone is much more positive. The memorandum says, it's one of the basic principles of Japan's development assistance policy to cooperate as much as possible for the success of the second United Nations development decade. Japan's already established the policy to endeavor to attain the volume target of 1% of its gross national product by 1975, and has made its intention known to strive to raise the ratio of official development assistance to GDP and to soften its terms and also to support actively the effort to facilitate international agreement on general untying of aid. And Japan was indeed prominent among the OECD countries in seeking to put in place uh, a multilateral agreement on untying of aid in the early 1970s, an effort which unfortunately failed for no fault of Japan. Jumping forward to 1982, <coughs> seems to be set against the background of a significant global economic crisis following the second oil shock. Japan's memorandum argues that, again I quote, developed countries should reaffirm that it is indispensable to strengthen economic, political and social resilience in developing countries by means of supporting their self-help efforts for economic and social development. At this time, political and security dimension receives specific mention too. Again I quote, Japan, as a member of the Western countries, actively promotes economic cooperation as an important element of its comprehensive security. In particular, Japan has been increasing its aid to the regions of vital importance to the maintenance of world peace and stability. So here you see a country which, within 20 years, has gone from one desperately wondering how it's going to finance aid program to one which is rapidly expanding it and uh, increasingly conscious of the expectations that the rest of the world increasingly has of it. 
And this sets the scene for more assertive language in the 1992 memorandum, which looks at the role of Japan's assistance after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and with a new emphasis on the global environment, the Rio uh, conference on uh, environment taking place uh, in the same year. And these, uh, Japan in this, Japan highlights what he called its four guidelines of ODA, which were shortly to be followed by Japan's first ODA charter, about which Professor Shimomura has written a very interesting uh, piece in his chapter of the book. These four guidelines where that Japan would pay full attention in the implementation of its ODA to the following four things. Trends in military expenditure, trends in the development and production of weapons of mass destruction, trends in the import and export of military arms, and efforts to promote democratization, the introduction of a market-oriented economy with respect to basic human rights and freedom. So here's Japan now taking a, a position which recognizes, I think, much more clearly some of the broader political and security context within which economic cooperation decisions were increasingly being taken at this time. On the global environment, Japan referred to a major initiative taken at the first Rio conference. It's interesting that the memorandum also mentions other transnational issues, including, and I quote, refugee assistance, AIDS, narcotics abuse, large-scale droughts. The world, the memorandum goes on to say, expects much of Japan's aid, and increasing the amount of aid that Japan is to provide, care must be taken to improve its quality. So again, Japan reflecting on now as a very major player, Japan at this point has just become the largest, for the first time, the largest donor in the whole world. Uh, of the expectations that people have been and the way it wants to present its aid in this new period. So I found all that extremely interesting, not least the, the contrast between the, uh, the earliest years and then the rapid rise of Japan over the next three decades. The reason I felt pretty dissatisfied with the process was that it seemed to me to reflect, on reflection, it seemed to me to show a degree of closed thinking on both sides. <laughs> the Secretariat of the OECD DAC, who have quite a bit of influence on the examining countries, seem to have applied a rather simplistic box of tools to judge Japanese aid. Basically, if you read the Secretariat comments on each of these memoranda, they're always arguing for more grants and fewer loans, more for basic needs and less for production and infrastructure more for Africa as opposed to Asia, and more for very poor countries generally as opposed to middle income countries. So it's a kind of set of points that are brought out by the Secretary in a very regular way. And then at the same time, you find Japan taking a rather defensive position on this, arguing the reasons why it can't respond as quickly Secretary of Might like to these various directions, or is doing what he can to advance in those directions. Rather than addressing both the strengths and the possible weaknesses of its developmental approach, it's not, it's not so obvious when you read these documents that Japan is really putting forward a Japanese view on why the approach it is taking might make very good development sense, as well as sense in terms of other Japanese interests. Also on the big issues, Japan, despite having in effect led the world at one time in the 1980s, when Japan in fact unilaterally untied its entire loan program at a time when European countries, and I remember this well from uh, managing the programs in Europe, uh, were increasingly providing their assistance, not least to Asia, in the form of tied mixed credits in a highly uh, commercial way. Um, but having led the world on time in the 1980s, Japan became one of the more reluctant participants in the eventual limited on-time agreement of 2001, though it did eventually agree. And then having taken this leading position 
and proposing uh, targets which eventually led to the Millennium Development Goal, there was no reference to this in the second charter of 2003. It seemed to me at the time an extraordinary um, omission from the country which had done most of the whole idea of uh, setting targets for international development on the world agenda. And then the sense in which there seemed to be a dialogue between Japan on, the, Japan on the one side and the rest of the committee on the other. Now, as I know well from chairing the DAC, the DAC is in fact quite complicated. Every member has its own particularities in its approach to aid, often stemming from historical factors or its own political economy. So there are different fault lines on different issues. As an example, I found myself uh, heavily involved as a DAC chair in the discussions about the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness in 2005. And along with um, the Japanese president of the Asian Development Bank, I was chairing the session in Paris on the final afternoon of this conference when we had a draft declaration. But we also had a standoff between the European Union on the one hand and the United States on the other. Basically, the European Union wanted to take a very forward position on commitments for aid effectiveness. The United States was extremely reluctant to commit itself to any quantitative targets. And it was Japan, as I remember extremely well, that suggested the compromise that led to the approval of the whole Paris Declaration. So without Japanese involvement, I don't think we succeeded in pulling off the Paris Declaration. Um, I don't think Japan's had enough credit for some of the constructive efforts it's made in those kind of directions. But I think over the years Japan has been doing more and in a way the dialogue was to some extent a dialogue of the death. If you stand back from this, my feeling is there could have been a more useful discussion about the strengths and indeed the weaknesses of a model that in many respects worked well in the context of Japan's main partners in Eastern and Southeastern Asia. Countries, one might say, with in general quite well, in general quite well-developed institutions, rising levels of education, and economies delivering rapid growth as population growth and therefore dependency levels fell. For example, loans were a perfectly valid instrument arguably more so than grants, particularly for tackling important economic problems. To that extent, concerns expressed by the DAC about the use of loans were probably overdone. Also, Japan's stronger focus on economic infrastructure in comparison with some donors who were more focused on what one might call basic needs, arguably responded to the real requirements for sustainable economic growth and self-reliance of many of its partners. On the other hand, critics may have had more of a point about whether Japan's aid has done enough to support what the 2015 Development Cooperation Charter calls quality growth, or inclusive growth, as um, Scanto Sanders just called it. And undoubtedly, we need to, going forward, we need, in all countries of the world, to be looking for growth which is inclusive sustainable and resilient. I recall speaking as a former resident of Bangkok, for example, Japanese support for doubling the size of the highway from Bangkok to the then International Airport, uh, just north of the city. I benefited from this, and it probably scored well in economic terms, but it was not going to deal with the deep-seated problems of rapid growth in Bangkok, as compared to persistent poverty in the northeast an issue that has increasingly jeopardized Thailand's overall prospects. This suggests to me some important issues for reflection, which I do not feel that the international discussion around development cooperation sufficiently recognizes. And that's despite the efforts which are very well captured in the book around learning from the East Asia model, the so-called miracle uh, paper of which John Page discusses at some length the is referred to by other authors. On the other hand, what was true for Southeast Asia in the 1970s and 1980s is increasingly the case for much of Africa at the present time, where you are seeing some stronger institutions developing, a sounder set 
and macroeconomic policies. Higher levels of education gradually and stronger and a stronger institutional environment. There's a long way to go. And indeed, as China has found out, there is a huge demand in Africa, as there was in Asia earlier, for aid on concessional loan terms to tackle major problems of economic infrastructure. On the other hand, it's not easy in Africa as elsewhere to spread the benefits of economic growth beyond the better connected areas or to lower income groups. There's scope for a more intelligent debate about how international partners can and should assist more effectively in policies aimed at broader based growth. The model of primacy for social investments has clear limits since it can result, has indeed resulted, in neglect of vital investments in infrastructure. But equally, too strong a focus on capital investment, and I think this is an issue that China needs to think about in particular, has equally problematic consequences for sustainable development in countries without a basic minimum tax base. I think in the 1970s, thinking back to British experience, we pursued the illusion that we could just finance capital investments and somehow or other they would be maintained. In practice, many of the countries where we built the roads and the wall, Bangladesh and so on, did not have the tax capacity to maintain it. And as a result, donors would go in and build the road, and five years later you'd go in and rebuild the road. And that was not a certain way to operate. So finally, um, here we are in 2016. We have the Sustainable Development Goals as our guide for the next decade and a half. What might we learn from what's worked well and not so well in Japan's cooperation with these countries? We still lack many of the basics that those of us living in richer countries take for granted. And in a world where movement of people, ideas, goods and services takes place at an ever-increasing pace. The final chapter of this book, and I'm so pleased that uh, Kato Sam went through it in some detail, has some really good thought-provoking ideas on this, which I commend to you. Here to finish are a few personal reflections of my own. Thinking first of, of the strengths of Japan's model, I do think that self-help, how do you describe it in English, as a core idea, is a very sound one. We, we learned in relation to the Paris Declaration, the importance of ownership, and I think this is um, Cannot cause, donors cannot cause development. All we can do is facilitate development by countries that are prepared to invest time and effort themselves. The strong lessons that we have from Japan's own development model, the scale at which Japan operates. There's an interesting statistic in one of the uh, reports about 1990 of Japan, I think, accounted for more than half the total bilateral projects over 50 million dollars by bilateral donors. Japan operates at a big scale, uh, despite the fact that, um, that overall Japan has um, seldom, except in the late 1990s, reached the average level of the uh, OECD DAC for the portion of its assistance in relation to gross national income. And this is just an update of a, of a table in the, in the chapter of my report. My chapter of the report. Japan's probably, in my view, a very reasonable balance between multilateral and bilateral aid. Japan certainly has very strong technical expertise backed by strong institutions. I think it's fair to say that the aid and investment model, which uh, you see in some of Japan's major area development programs, is a distinctively Japanese um, uh, offering, which has been, in many ways, extremely effective. There are some good examples of what you and I think Japan has created over time a very effective bilateral delivery system through JICA. I think that the way in which Japan has brought the various instruments together in one implementing agency is highly commendable uh, and uh, has a lot of strengths. I have a, a great deal of respect for the way that uh, Madame Nagata uh, pushed the decentralization of JICA. I think that JICA has become a much more significant and effective player on a very well um, and Japan has been a leader in trilateral cooperation. I think that's again another important piece of Japanese initiative which has uh, a lot of value to everyone. Some challenges? Well, I think that in a way, Kato San's already said some of this. 
I think Japan has struggled to make a consistent case domestically for its international cooperation in what has been a very tight fiscal situation. We all know that Japan's uh, debt in relation to uh, gross national income is horrendously high. Japan's been now very constrained fiscally. Um, but I think that apart from humanitarian aid where there's strong Japanese support, I don't know that in Japan the aid has really gathered the attention of people outside uh, the institutions that are most closely concerned with uh, the international cooperation. So to some extent, I think it's conceived of something that Japan had to do as it rejoined the community of nations in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and it probably had a lot of support doing exactly that. But I'm not sure that the government has really managed to maintain a kind of narrative about why Japan is doing this that has had sufficient uh, pull with the Japanese public. Um, and I think that, in a way, a stronger evidence-based narrative about what continues to make Japan's approach distinctive and what needs to be done to improve effectiveness further, particularly making a reality of quality growth, is really important. And speaking as chair of the board of the International Initiative Impact Evaluation, I do, of course, have an interest in declaring this, but I do very strongly believe that promoting better evaluation of the impact of public programs in all countries is a matter of very high importance, and it's why I'm in Japan today. In this context, I very much welcome the role of the JICA Research Institute, whose building we have the pleasure of having this meeting, and the evaluation of the departments in JICA in building this evidence base. I think that's really important. Um, I do think there's work to be done on how you can apply what Japan has done successfully in stronger institutional environments, how you can apply some of that to weaker institutional environments in fragile settings. I do think that there's still work to be done in finding a constructive way to work with Japan's own civil society. And it may be that there's more to be done in helping in enabling Japanese institutions as opposed to individual Japanese experts to develop longer term links with uh, institutions in other countries where we have a lot of and support. And finally, I'd like to see a bigger Japanese role in international policy discussions and international cooperation more generally. For example, why are we still waiting for the first Japanese chair of the development system?